Let's get the latest on the Israel-Hamas war, and for that we turn to national security analyst Hal Kempfer. Hal, always good to see you. A lot to get into today. Let's get straight into it. Israeli warplanes bombed Iran's embassy in Syria today, marking an escalation in a war that is pitting Israel against many of its Iran-backed regional adversaries. Tehran has said that the strike killed seven military advisors, including three senior commanders. Hal, Israel targeting an Iranian embassy directly in daylight. Uh, this seems like a significant escalation. Does, does this feel like it falls within the unwritten rules of this war? Uh, Austin, it is a significant escalation. There's just no two ways to put it. I mean, they hit a diplomatic compound. Now, Israel, uh, even though they don't admit that they uh, actually attacked uh, a diplomatic uh, compound, they say it's a separate building. It's not part of the embassy complex. Uh, I've heard it described as a consulate. I've heard it described as a consular section uh, of the embassy in a separate annex building. But whatever it is, it uh, it's normally considered under international law uh, sovereign territory of that nation, uh, Iranian territory. So technically, uh, this strike was on Iranian territory. Obviously, a, a strike on territory could be met with a, a variety of levels of force. Um, and, and certainly Iran has uh, said that they will respond very strongly. However, with that said, there's a lot of reasons why uh, Iran does not want to get into a war with Israel, nor the United States for that matter. And so uh, it's not quite clear what that response will be. And there's gonna be a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on uh, Khomeini and his uh, regime, his uh, you know very, uh, uh, very uh, religious right, if you will, uh, Shiite uh, theocracy, uh, to do something. And of course, the Al Quds force probably represents the uh, the militant arm of that theocracy. But uh, generally, within Iran, they do not want to get into a war because they know they could lose. And uh, Hezbollah will also be dragging their feet as they have since it began because they know they could lose too. So yes, this is an escalation. It potentially could cause a major regional war to break out theoretically, but with that said, there's also a lot of uh, pushback, if you will, uh, force fields, if you will, pushing back away from escalation uh, beyond too much further than what it is. As discussed, Iran is not being shy about wanting to respond to this attack. What avenues do they have in order to respond? Well, they've already done some things. Um, they, you know, Hezbollah uh, did some attacks. Uh, there was an attack, I believe, at the Al Tamf base, U.S. base uh, in uh, Syria, which hasn't been attacked, I think, since February, is my recollection. Uh, there was also a report of uh, missiles and drones uh, in the Red Sea fired by Houthis, and there was also a report that uh, an, an Israeli air base, I mean, Israeli naval base in the south. Uh, was attacked by uh, Houthi rebels firing uh, a long-range missile. All of these things uh, are, uh, you know, they, they, they could be seen as response. I have to tell you, within the context and, the, and the, uh, the level of fighting that's been going on, they don't really stand out as, as exceptional. It's almost like Monday uh, in that war, so uh, it, it, within the region. So, I, I mean, yes, it's technically a response, but, you know, you have to remember, from Khomeini's standpoint, from a national sta nationalist standpoint in Iran, they do feel compelled to do something. I mean, if you look at that building, they dropped that entire annex building. That is a uh, comprehensive uh, strike. That is not uh, a little strike. That building is, is, is rubble. It's on the ground. Now, I will point something out here, uh, which I, I found rather interesting. Look at the buildings around it. They don't appear to be extensively damaged which gives you an idea of the precision with which the Israeli, if that was an Israeli strike, the precision of the strike that took place that was able to completely destroy that building, yet the buildings around it are uh, relatively undamaged uh, by comparison. It really is a, a, a stunning uh, picture of uh, some of the uh, precise weaponry that can be employed these days, uh, certainly by the US and its allies um, and uh, and it's probably more likely than not, even though Israel has not acknowledged this, that this this truly was an Israeli strike uh, that took this building down. Why is it when we hear of uh, Israel attacking places in southern Lebanon, when we hear them doing their back and forth with Hezbollah, why is it that Israel takes responsibility for those types of attacks? But why is it that they might stay silent on one like this specifically? Certain types of attacks, they just there is no gain 
by taking responsibility on this. Uh, in fact, there is a uh, by taking gain, it, it can also it can be interpreted regionally as as almost boastful. Uh, basically, uh, it would be to accelerate the situation if Israel is to go in there and do a strike like this, and then uh, come out publicly and say, "Oh yes, we did this strike." Uh, that puts phenomenal pressure on Iran. It puts pressure on Hezbollah and others to to respond in a more forceful way than they might otherwise. So there is no gain for Israel to acknowledge that they did this strike. And uh, so on this one, they're going to stay quiet. And by the way, Israel has stayed quiet on other strikes, although Israel does have a, a history of when they do strikes, for example, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, if there's controversy on that, they will do an investigation. They will come out and explain if they did it. And in some cases, they've, they've made mistakes and they've been very forthright in admitting they made mistakes in targeting. In other cases, uh, there was a lot of Hamas propaganda trying to misconstrue what the strike was or the effects of the strike. And they've come out and uh, put out a corrective message on that. Although I will say on that latter, I don't think the world listens too much. Uh, the, the Hamas message, as they say, you know, there's an old saying that the, the, you know, the lie will travel the world 10 times before the truth gets out the door. And uh, same thing with some of this propaganda. It tends to get out there, set the stage for the story and whatever investigation comes back later, it's very tough to correct whatever that initial uh, narrative was that was put forth. What do we know about who exactly was targeted in this attack? As I said earlier, seven military advisors, including three senior commanders. Do we know what exact operations these operatives were undertaking? What kind of uh, activities were they involved in? Well, Brigadier General uh, Mohammad Reza uh, Zahadi was basically the Al-Quds commander, if you will, for Iraq and Syria. Uh, he was the lead uh, for that area. And uh, uh, it's not been confirmed yet, but it sounds like he was leading a high-level meeting uh, his deputy was in that meeting with him and other key uh, decision makers, other other key coordinators, if you will, of uh, uh, not just uh, what the IRGC and Al-Quds is doing in that region, but also what their proxies are doing in that region were meeting in there. Now, it's not quite sure what they were meeting on. It's not quite sure if maybe there was some uh, planning that was taking place or something like that. but. Uh, but it was a, a very uh, targeted strike mission uh, going after uh, command and control uh, uh, targets, for lack of a better term. And it, it appeared to hit exactly what they were aiming at, and it appeared to be very much confined. Again, I point back to the precision of the strike and the fact that the buildings around it are still left standing, looking right or, right, largely intact, while the building itself with the intended targets uh, has completely collapsed and was destroyed. So that's kind of what you saw in there. And, and, you know, I would say this, behind the 2020 strike by the U.S. and Iraq on uh, Major General Soleimani, the head of uh, the Al-Quds force, uh, the RGC Major General, uh, that short of that, this is the most uh, high-level strike we've seen against uh, IRGC and Al-Quds uh, since 2020 in the last four years. We'll be watching the situation closely out of Syria and Iran. I do want to move on, Hal. Uh, this tweet coming in from a Reuters reporter, the Biden administration is weighing whether to go ahead with a major $18 billion package of arms transfers to Israel that would involve 25 F-15 aircrafts and munitions, according to three sources familiar with the matter, telling Reuters on Monday. A Reuters source says that the sale of the 25 planes has been under review since January of 2023, but Israel's defense minister wants the delivery to be sped up, Hal. What could be the use for these? Uh, what could be the use for these F-15s in the immediate to near future on the Israeli side? Austin, these F-15s are, are not the F-15s of yesteryear. Uh, F-15 as a platform has been around for a very long time. I mean, some will remember it's like I think the F-15s came back uh, came into service back in the early 70s. Well, they did come into service in the 70s, but this current F-15 is dramatically modified. It's an air superiority aircraft. It has tremendous strike capabilities. Uh, it carries a lot of different weapon systems, carries a lot of different avionics, takes a, t carries a lot of um, unusual things. It's not a stealth aircraft per se, although it does have a, a number of things that make it less less easily detected, if you will, uh, in flight. So it's a it's an air superiority aircraft in, 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 in any way of describing it. So that's why they want it. It gives them a uh, 
a huge advantage in air to air combat and strike mission capability uh, throughout the region, which is what they need. And that's why they want it in. Now, this is saying 25. I was reading a report that said uh, when it's all said and done, it could get up to 50 uh, of these uh, F 15 uh, aircraft. So it's, uh, it's quite a capability. Uh, that we'll bring in. And uh, obviously they want to get it sooner rather than later. They could certainly use it now if they had it. The other thing too to point out is that Israel already has a large cadre of F-15 qualified pilots, a lot of them with tremendous combat experience. So their ability to um, assimilate and absorb a, a, a large air, aircraft shipment like this uh, is very fast. It's very different than say our Ukraine where we had to train these pilots to fly F-16s. They already have pilots that are very tr well trained and experienced flying uh, F-15. So it's one of these things when they arrive, they can put them right into service. I do want to talk about Gaza real quick before we go here. Let's look at this tweet from the Washington Times. We're hearing reports saying that Israeli military has withdrawn from Gaza's largest hospital early Monday after a two week raid that engulfed the facility and surrounding districts and fighting. The IDF has described the raid on Shifa Hospital as a major battlefield victory in the war. Now, as this Shifa operation comes to an end, Hal, I, I want to reflect on this a bit. Why, why was this raid significant, and what did we learn about how Hamas uses hospitals specifically in this war? Austin, that, that question is, is the heart of the matter, which is uh, Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uh, both use hospitals, mosques, schools, what under international law are, are, are considered protected sites. They're not supposed to be targeted. They use them for military purposes. Under international law, when you use a, a, a facility, even a protected site for military purposes, it loses its protected status. That's what Hamas has done with hospitals. They've also done with schools and mosques and other uh, sites, uh, even aid centers, if you will, uh, throughout Gaza. And, and of course, their goal is if the Israelis strike them, they then uh, reach out across the world to try to, uh, try to foment hue and cry uh, about uh, striking these facilities. And they also keep civilians around them. So whatever happens, they want to maximize the amount of civilian casualties in whatever Israeli military action uh, would take place. That appears to be what happened here. You may recall that Al-Shifa uh, was uh, uh, previously did have uh, the Israelis go in there. The Israelis found tunnels around that complex uh, that was covered for quite some time, that it was being used as a command and control. Now, one of the things I point out is Israel, even though they they occupy, if you will, the northern area completely, and they have freedom of movement, they still have been taking fighting up there. And and my my, this is just experience talking. Why would they go to all the trouble of hitting that hospital, knowing they're going to take international condemnation for hitting the hospital? because they must have had very compelling intelligence saying that, that this is where they are. This is what they're, it's being used for. And that's why they went in there. And certainly if you look at what came out of it, uh, the number of prisoners, the number of uh, militants that were killed, uh, all the intelligence weapons, everything else that came out of that hospital, it's absolutely clear that that hospital was being used for military purposes. But I, I think within the Israeli calculus, the IDF calculus, if they didn't have overwhelming intelligence, probably intelligence they've garnered in the last few weeks prior to going in there, I don't think they would have uh, gone in there just because of the international backlash that inherently incurs by going going into a hospital complex. All right, Hal, we'll have to leave it there for now. We always appreciate your insight. Have a good day.